Hello everyone, my name is Glenn Bagent, and as you know, I applied for a position with you, and I was excited when I got the email asking me to do a video uh, answering these four questions that you've required. Um, I must say that uh, I have a newfound appreciation for cinematographers. Uh, I'm not sure what take I'm up to on this one, it's probably nine or ten at this point, and uh, hopefully I can get through this one without uh, anything falling apart on me. Um, so again, thank you. Uh, I'm really appreciative of you asking me, and I hope that I can provide all of the uh, answers that you require. So, question number one, um, the optimal teaching schedule. Um, as you know from my CV, I have probably 22, 23 years teaching experience, so I've done a lot of this. In terms of an optimal teaching schedule, um, to answer your question, I, I'm going to do this kind of by backwards induction. I looked up uh, on your website the schedule for the fall classes, and I see that most of the uh, classes like fixed income, uh, investments, advanced uh, corporate finance, those, those types of things are already covered. Uh, but what I did see was, I think, 11 sections of the principles of finance that have the name staff written next to them. Uh, that I assume you want to change to a real human being uh, in the fall. Uh, from that, what I was able to discern is that there's really two groups of them. There's the Tuesday, Thursday, and then there's the Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Uh, they all seem to be day classes. I like day classes. I've taught a lot of evening classes, uh, sometimes till 1030 in the evening. Uh, but I do prefer the day classes. Uh, if I had a choice between Tuesday, Thursday, or Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I would probably choose Tuesday, Thursday. Um, I like the classes that tend to be a little bit longer, uh, usually more than an hour. The Monday, Wednesday, Friday ones tend to be around 50 minutes to an hour, that sort of thing. So uh, I feel I could teach more effectively in a Tuesday, Thursday uh, type environment. But um, it really doesn't matter. Um, the, and if that's the requirement, principles of finance, I've taught it, I estimate somewhere more than 100 times over the last 20 years or so. So um, I'm well equipped. I'm ready to go. I have a large uh, catalog of assignments, practice problems, lecture notes, uh, videos, that sort of thing. Um, I've also taught online, in class, obviously. So... Uh, you know, to answer your question, I really don't have a uh, preference, slight preference towards Tuesday, Thursday, but Monday, Wednesday, Friday would be okay. Also, um, in terms of teaching, you could ask me to teach just about anything. Um, I'm at a point where I guess you could kind of pull a string on my back and an organized course would fall off very quickly. So I've taught everything from quantitative methods, statistics, principles of finance, financial management, working capital management, theory of finance. Um, so I have a long resume in terms of uh, teaching. So uh, well equipped to uh, move forward there. Uh, that's one of the advantages of being a little bit older is that um, if put into a new position, like I would be taking at University of Delaware, um, less time on prep and more time focused on students and other activities. So, uh, that's teaching. Question number two, what are my research interests? Well, uh, I could go through my CV. Uh, I have 18 articles published to this point. Uh, I don't know what the numbers are. Probably half of them are sole author, the other half co-author. One third of them are probably theoretical, the other two thirds are probably uh, empirical in nature. I like to work uh, in both aspects. The perfect paper for me actually would be uh, to come up with some sort of a theoretical model uh, and then actually test it. I think that makes for a complete paper. But uh, what am I working on right now? I'm, I'm gonna break these into two segments. Uh, large projects, which are take longer, and then the smaller ones. In terms of the large projects, uh, I've been working on this one for a few years, Modigliani and Miller, um, capital structure theories, of course, and I'm gonna have to do a little bit of a reach here, but uh, you probably know this equation, it's in the 
you know, the undergrad textbooks. The value of the Liebert firm is, the un is equal to the value of the unlevered firm plus present value of a tax shelter from debt. But Myers later on made this uh, extension to it that you have to subtract the present value of financial distress and bankruptcy costs. From my reading, this, this part is uh, really found empirically, but I think I'm very close to having a closed form solution to it. Um, it's been tricky. Uh, I've been working and thinking about it for a few years but I think I cracked it uh, not too long ago. I need to formalize it and, and finish it. But uh, that's one of the larger projects that I'm working on. Uh, the next one, uh, technical analysis, that is really a carryover from my dissertation. Uh, I'm allowing for a variety of variables in this one. Uh, price, obviously, trading volume, but I, what I included include in it is the correlation of the trade. So it's really picking up a market sentiment uh, metric that I've put into it. Uh, that's a very long theoretical, uh, highly mathematical paper. Uh, it doesn't present well because it's all theory. Uh, the last piece that I'm working on is behavioral. Uh, I'm trying to find a link between prospect theory as written by Kahneman and Tversky and actually put call parity. I'm trying to prove that put call parity is a special case of prospect theory. Um, still working on that one. It's a lofty goal, I know, but uh, I'm gonna give it a try anyway. Uh, that's the larger uh, project. The smaller ones, I've been working on ETFs uh, pretty much since they came out. Uh, I've been looking at them in terms of market efficiency uh, in one aspect, that I think they have a uh, great or they make a great contribution to market efficiency and the completeness of the capital markets. Um, for example, September 2008, the SEC put a restriction on uh, trading financial stocks, in, in particular shorting uh, financial stocks. Well, you can't short the individual financial stocks, but you can still short XLF, which is the sector spider for the financial uh, sector. What happened during that period of time is that the market cap for uh, XLF went up by $6 billion. Uh, the number of outstanding shares increased uh, enormously. And as soon as the restriction was lifted, it went down by about $6 billion. The number of shares went back to exactly what it was before. So it seems like the uh, ETFs are kind of like an overflow tank that they contribute to market efficiency. Uh, by completing the markets of what individuals really want to do in trading. They can they may not be able to do with individual securities, but they can do through the uh, ETFs. Uh, I also have a category here, PCP, that's put call parity. I've been looking at uh, the options column, put options on ETFs, and I find that there's there are arbitrage opportunities there. The put call parity doesn't hold. I don't know why. I think it might be a result of thin trading, but that's something that I need to uh, investigate. I've been looking at it for a short period of time, um, shorter papers. I also like to work on pedagogical materials. Um, I think that there's an opportunity in teaching uh, that you can explain things that are in the textbooks uh, better and more completely than are actually done. Um, so I try to work on pedagogical materials. I did one article uh, a number of years ago. It was uh, advances in financial education. I'm kind of proud of that one. The students really liked it. So uh, in terms of research, full agenda. Uh, I, I, I think a pretty good level of achievement. Um, I'm open to collaboration. And that's one of the attractive things about uh, the position that you have is a lot of resources and a well-accomplished uh, faculty that I could collaborate with, uh, ask questions, maybe contribute uh, in my own way. So, a uh, pretty complete uh, picture of my research interests, I hope. Third question, where do I expect to be in five years? Well, I'll start here at the bottom. Um, you're looking for someone to make a commitment, a longer-term commitment, um, and that's what I'd like to do. I don't want to be moving around at this stage. 
Um, so if I'm successful in getting this position and, and, and all that, uh, five years, I would still expect to be at the University of Del Delaware. I don't think there'd be any reason to uh, not have that expectation. But beyond that, uh, I would expect to have five or 10 more publications than I do right now. I'd like to be closer to the 10 number than the five. Uh, because it is five years, and I think I'm capable of doing more than one per year. So I'd like to have uh, between five and ten more publications. I would like to complete the CFA. I've started the readings a number of times, but I've never completed them, but it is on the list of things that I would like to uh, accomplish. I think it would make me a better professional. I think it would make me a better instructor. So I'd like to get that off the list as well. Um, Beyond that, I'd like to have some expanded teaching. Uh, one of the things I did a few years back when I was at Long Island University is, uh, it was interesting, I had some, uh, some students from the math department, they came to me and, and they wanted to become actuarials. And th there wasn't anything in place for them to do that. So it took me maybe 30 minutes of my time to do a little research, order the forms, complete the forms, um, so we actually set up a, a nice program between the mathematics department and the uh, finance department. I found that the math students uh, were really good finance students. They, they could get more into the intuition um, of what was being taught rather than struggling with the math. So uh, different programs like that uh, I'd like to see uh, developed. Now the last question, question for NPV, how would I explain that to Typical problem that you would have presented in uh, principles of finance. It goes well beyond that, as you know. Uh, you could use this in an investments class or just about anything in finance. Now, what I've written here is just a simple problem. It has four periods, minus 100 at time zero, so that would be the initial investment cost. It generates cash flows of 50, 40, 40, and 15. And the question is should you make this investment or not? Probably a simple way to start would be, well, you're going to spend $100, do you at least get your $100 back? Well, after one year, one period, let's assume three years, after one year, you have $50 back. After two years, you have 40, so there's 90. And then after three years, well, you're up to 130. So you've at least obtained your money. At least you got your money back. And we, we call that payback period, but uh, we also know that it's not really best measure of whether to invest in something or not. You can take this to an extreme and say, well, you know, uh, time zero minus, minus one million dollars and then 40 years later, you get back one million plus one dollar. Well, you got your money back and you actually got an extra dollar, but you had to wait 40 years in order to get it. That wouldn't be a very good investment. I don't think many people would uh, choose that. Why not? Well, because over the 40 year period, there's an opportunity cost. So we need to include that. So, let's make the required rate of return for this equal to 15%. That'll cover that opportunity cost for us. So let, let's compute it. It's a straightforward application of time value of money. I'm just going to jump in front of the camera for a second. NPV 50 over 1.15 plus 40 over 1.15 squared plus another 40 over 1.15 cubed plus 15 over 1.15 to the fourth. That's just a straightforward application of time value of money. This is the present value of the future cash flows. And what we teach the students is that the value of an asset is the present value of the future cash flows. Well, that's what we have right here. We have the present value of the future cash flows. That's the value. But if it's net present value, you must be subtracting something. So minus. 100. So we have a value and a cost. This is 
equal to 108.6 minus 100 equals 8.6. This investment has a value today of 108.6 and it has a cost today of 100. It's worth more than it costs. Value minus cost. 8.6. So if you were to invest in this, it would be the equivalent of adding 8.6 whatever. Maybe it's million, maybe it's billion, maybe it's just dollars. Maybe it's just 8.6 dollars. The fact that it's greater than zero means that you have added value to whatever. What is it most likely? You have added value to the firm. This methodology is straightforward. It's a straightforward application of the time value of money. There's the value, there's the cost. It's all in present value terms at this point. And the result of it is plus 8.6. It's an investment that should be undertaken. If this was equal to zero, it would be irrelevant. You would have the same value as it costs. If this number was less than this number, it would be negative. You'd actually be losing value. So that is, that's the basics of uh, net present value. We can do other things with this, of course. Uh, I only have just four or five minutes to explain this, but you have other things you, that you can do. You can make this equal to zero. You could solve the, for the, what's called the internal rate of return, which is the amount of return, the rate of return that you would earn in each period. Uh, you could scale it. You could find a... Uh, profitability index, there's a variety of things that you can do. Um, this, of course, would be expanded upon uh, the straightforward application. The difficulty in capital budgeting is actually estimating what these cash flows are, estimating what the required rate of return is. Even the uh, life of the uh, investment project is, is something that, in reality, is uh, unknown. But we take it as given during this competition. So, that's the present value. It's value minus cost. Uh, I believe I have reached about the 15 or 16 minute mark, so I'm going to conclude. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this short presentation, and I hope to hear from you soon uh, in a positive way. Thank you for your time, uh, and again, I do look forward to uh, hopefully meeting you. So, thank you again.